Welcome to RHI's Sociable City Interviews, where we meet with global thought leaders on nightlife and the social economy. Today, we are here with Sasha Lord, Nighttime Economy Advisor for Greater Manchester. He's chair of the Nighttime Industry Association, co-founder of Park Life, the UK's largest metropolitan celebration of music and culture, and co-founder of The Warehouse Project, the UK's largest nightclub with a capacity of 10,000. He recently launched his tell-all book, Tales from the Dance Floor. Well, hello. It's so great to have you here. It's quite an honor. Uh, you're a legend in your own way in the UK. And now that your book is coming out, I'm sure you'll get a lot more recognition for that. Uh, so I'm really just interested in, in beginning our conversation um, with a little bit of your background. So tell me a little bit about your history. So... Um... I'll be honest, I'll, I'll level with you, Jim. I'm not embarrassed to say I've done all right in, in life. Um, that's obviously down to hard work, but two main things, actually. Uh, it wouldn't have happened if I weren't born, A, in Manchester, and if I wasn't born in the year I was, because it meant that when I was in the sixth form, the whole world was looking at our music scene. So the Stone Roses, Happy Mondays, New Order, Factory Records, the whole city was bouncing. And this is before people were looking at Berlin and Barcelona and everything. It was all about what was coming from our city. And I became absolutely obsessed with this nightclub called the Hacienda. And to my parents' absolute disappointment, my mum still talks about it to this day, I failed all my A-levels at school. So when everybody in my class was going to Oxford to be doctors or Cambridge to become accountants at St. Andrews in Scotland, I went to work in a clothes shop, but I was obsessed with the music scene. Anyway, I put my first night on 4th of July, 1994. And if you said to me at that point, 30 years down the line, you're going to have the biggest, or one of the biggest nightclub capacities in the world with the warehouse project at 10,000 capacity of Friday and Saturdays, the biggest metropolitan festival in the UK, Par Life, it's 80,000, but also be the nighttime economy advisor to the mayor of Greater Manchester, I would have thought you'd completely lost the plot. Mm. But somehow, because of that fluke that happened in 1989, I managed to end up in uh, doing all right in 2024. Sounds, sounds like a massive uh, evolution. <clears throat> and uh, and so we're here to really talk about your book and some of what you write about in the book, but mostly, you know, just about some of the significant changes. So 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 when you said you you started to get into the club scene back then. What what were those club scenes like? It was the, the phrase acid house was used mm. at that point. So there was no coincidence. House music arrived in Manchester from the States at exactly the same time as ecstasy. Right. So also it was this big explosion of, of house music that happened. Um, but it's interesting when you talk about the evolution, the very first paragraph of the book in the mid nineties, I'm dragged into a car by some gangsters from a place called Salford. And Manchester was quite a nasty place at that time. The gangsters were running the doors. Um, and now, you know, 30 years later, you wouldn't even hear of the stories that used to happen back in those days. We were nicknamed, embarrassing the gym, we were nicknamed Gunchester at what point, because guns on the doors were quite, it was quite a common thing to see. But certainly now it's, it's, it is a, a you know a business and the nighttime economy is recognized in its own right and in parallel to the nighttime economy. You know, people mainly work nine to five, but the nighttime economy is just as important. And when we say nighttime economy, Greater Manchester is everything from six in the evening to six in the morning, of which my sector, hospitality sector and events, is a third. A third of it's actually the NHS, if you think about the hospitals working throughout the night. Mm -hmm. And then the final third is people that work in factories, shift pattern workers. I picked up the nighttime economy term uh, uh, probably in the early 2000s when the Association of Town Center Management had a conference and they gave an award uh, for the nighttime economy uh, for town centers. And this was before the purple flag and everything. Yep. And that's how I got to know Paul Davies. <clears throat> and, uh, and then eventually I, I spoke at the what was it called? The Magic Carpet. It's like a a museum of magic. I spoke there, and, and uh, that's when I met Philip Colvin. I had dinner with Philip and nice. and uh, Paul Davies, 
Yeah, so that concept I brought back to the U.S., the nighttime economy as a term, and, and then over the years, you know, began to see that it was more than just the music, entertainment, nightlife, that, that really there's a whole sector of the economy that uh, works, you know, early evening and, and, and early morning. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think it's something that as a city region, Manchester, Greater Manchester really understands the importance of it, especially when events happen. So, for example, my um part life festival that takes place this year is eighth and eighth and ninth of june in a in a park forget what happens within the perimeter of the fence but in terms of hotels taxis restaurants bars maybe a new outfit for you going to the it brings in about 13 and a half million pounds into the local economy mm -hmm. so the council really understand the importance of those uh, this is really an important point that a lot of people don't understand and it's it's the money that people spend to go out in addition to the money that they spend in the venue itself. And, and sometimes uh, there's not a correlation <clears throat> between the two. You know, the hair salons, the nail salons, the fashion clothing stores, all of those places, you know, depend upon a vibrant uh, nighttime social economy. And uh, sometimes we, we fail to think that the daytime economy is really driven to a large extent uh, in some sectors by uh, people going out to socialize. It is. Um, I'd, I'd argue as well, Jim. <clears throat> gymnasiums, you know, people go to gymnasiums because they want to look good when they're going out. So, yeah, you, you're absolutely right. It's a very, very important point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I've kind of lost that um, that motivation. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, so. So what are the changes? So from these early days of a gangster uh, kind of nightlife world uh, with a lot of violence, which which really uh, it was probably a, a decade or more later that the Best Bar None program evolved. And then uh, after that, the Purple Flag program. So the UK is known for these innovations in um, approaches to managing the nighttime economy, um, what I call the nighttime social economy. But uh, how 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 are you involved in the evolution of all of this, uh, and and what did you think of these in initiatives? Obviously, the Best Bar None program was uh, perhaps a, 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 an incentive for businesses to become part of a solution. Well, I I was proud to win. Uh, in fact, it's on my wall here from the House of Lords. I won. Best Bar None for Manchester in 2012, I think it was. We went to the House of Lords to, to win it. I, look, I, I think Purple Flag, Best Bar None, any of the initiatives like that are fantastic. And it shows that whichever city region is taking them up, they understand the importance of the nighttime economy. Um, and it's, it's it's a stamp of approval, isn't it? Mm. Um, you know, and, and to go through Purple Flag, for example, which... Greater Manchester made up of 10 boroughs. So 50% of the boroughs have now got purple flag. But you assess the nighttime economy. And it's not just, have you got a nightclub to go to? But actually, do you cater for absolutely everybody? You know, all, all ages, do you cater for all religions? Um, you know, is it accessible? I've got wheelchair access. Is the street lighting good? Is the litter cleaned up at 5 a.m. in the morning? So all these things come into the process and you self-assess it. And the assessors come around and tell you whether you, you pass or not. But I think it, I really support them. And I was very heavily involved with Best Barn On and Purple Flag and still am. So so what about the uh, the changes that happened in the operations of the nightclubs from when you began to where you are today? You know, obviously, uh, there's no comparison when you have a 10,000 occupancy event or or, or space um, to, to the changes that had to occur just in terms of security and, and, and service staff and, uh, you know, the technicians that are involved in the lighting and the sound and, yeah. and all of those changes that have, have occurred. You know, I remember back in 72 when we had a club you know, a strobe light was kind of a cool thing in a nightclub, you know, um, but just look going today to the the technology of 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 the DJ, you know, my 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 era was vinyl. <clears throat> and so now when I see the way that the DJs uh, perform and they're really not only just about the sound, they're about the the lighting and, and the ways in which the, the they have video presentations while they're 
doing their thing. It's like a, 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 a massive undertaking. So so how did you witness all of this and how did you kind of see the future as you were evolving? I think um, I'll get to the technology bit at the end, but certainly the big things that stand out for me was when I started, nightclubs used to close at 2 a.m. Mm -hmm. And that is ridiculous. Also, in those days, you could smoke in a nightclub. Mm -hmm. uh, and bizarrely, Jim, you have to serve food as well. So most nightclubs in Greater Manchester had a microwave with, a, with an out-of-date lasagna sat in it. No one eats in a nightclub. But yeah. that's how we used to operate, to tick all the boxes for the license. But on the production side, you're absolutely right. You know, I, I the technology I see now is phenomenal. Last season, you know, you, obviously you've got the big gas canisters, you've got the, the enormous LED screens behind the artists. I, I saw fireworks flying across. There was wire in the ceiling and, and rockets were going down there. You've got fire cannons, glitter cannons, lasers. And you're right, when you look at... And you and I had a conversation beforehand about Studio 54. And, I, you know, I'm jealous anybody that went there. But that was all about the vinyl experience. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not just about what you're playing. And let's be honest, nine times out of ten, they're just plugging a laptop in. It's not just about you are playing. The kids want the whole visual performance. Yeah, yeah. And this is, there's a very big debate that's happening. I don't know if it's just a UK thing or worldwide thing now. And you see a photograph of an array of heads when the DJ comes on and they've all got the phones out taking the picture. And other people say, well, in my day, you know, you'd never have your phones out. It was about dancing, it was about the music. And I have to point out to a lot of those people that actually back in their day, they didn't have mobile phones. Never mind, never mind a camera on the mobile phone. I certainly didn't when I started to go out. But I can understand now with the likes of Instagram and TikTok why people want to take that moment they'll, they'll never forget. Mm -hmm. It's very similar to it, like David Beckham taking a corner kick at Manchester United. You know, you're there, you, you can't, you want to take that moment to remember it. So I understand it. And I think, you know, especially when you're paying $50 to get into a club to see a, a, an artist with amazing production, it's up to the customer what they want to do. If they want to take pictures, take a picture. If you don't, just get on with it. Um, but yeah, it's it is the production levels we see these days is immense, especially the festivals. You know, you look at something like Tomorrowland, and wow, if if somebody 50 years ago could have looked at a, a festival like Tomorrowland, they'd think it was like space age made up. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. and it's evolving, it's not stopping, it's not slowing down. You you bring up a point. Uh <clears throat> we worked in Providence, Rhode Island, uh back in the early 2000s. And it was right after, I think it was in Newport, Rhode Island, that there were, there was a club that had a live music festival. And there was uh, issues around sound. So the club brought in all of this insulation, right? They put in some insulation. And uh, the local uh, radio station and the beer distributor promoted the event to the extent that it got really crowded. And, and so what happened was the, the performers had a kind of an explosion part of the event, you know? And that triggered a fire because the sound installation that the club put in uh, was not fireproof. It was actually quite flammable. And wow. so in a very short period of time, the whole club caught on fire and people died. And, and so that to me is one of the early phases. Uh, and it also led to a lot of changes in terms of the way the fire codes and the way they work with venues around some of these uh, pyrotechnics. So, so how does the government, in terms of uh, fire safety, crowd control, exiting, security, you know, uh, all of these uh, elements that that create that can be associated with some of this activity? Um, how have you seen government kind of evolving to be supportive, unlike? in the early years in, in Rhode Island, where they came in with a very draconian approach to basically limited this type of activity. Well, certainly back in when I started, security staff, when we speak about the, you know, the gangster years, they weren't regulated at all. Now you've got to have cred checks on yourself. You've got to have checks on criminal records. You've got to go through a course. But when it comes to regulation, there are five licensing objectives to get a license. 
And everything's decided in Parliament at the moment. And I, I think it's a bit of a broken system because why is Parliament, you know, in London telling the rest of the country what is right and what is wrong? So we have a general election coming up, Jim, at the end of this year. I suspect it's going to be the 14th of November. Um, and I'm at the moment lobbying the government to say, look, you need to give more devolved powers to the city regions. Let the mayors or the leaders of each Manchester, Liverpool, Leeds, Sheffield, let them decide how they should be governing their night time. Not all powers, but certainly give them more powers, because I think it, it feels very, very, you've got a much better system. In, in the states in, in terms of voting ours is just all concentrated on one place westminster and it really doesn't work well we can have a long debate about who has a better system <laughs> not, not you can have our prime minister <laughs> <laughs> well you could have our trump so um <laughs> i don't want him <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow uh along those lines i remember because uh, uh, that's how i met uh, philip colvin and paul davies um and and the 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 twenty four seven licensing, in fact, I I I did a nighttime tour in in uh, in London with an inspector, uh, right after the that legislation took effect, and he he was talking about police inspectors. So he was talking about how useful it is because it it certainly allows for a better method to have a checkbox of what a venue is supposed to do. And it kind of, I, I, I kind of get a sense that Purple Flag and Best Bar None kind of evolved from that, that five point standard. So I yes. think that, that it has a good element, but I'm confused because my understanding was the way that 24 seven licensing was established, it was up to the local jurisdiction to be the ones that reviewed and made uh, decisions. No, you're absolutely right. So Decisions are made locally, but the guidance comes from Parliament. So they're the ones that say, you know, these are five objectives, and then it's up to locally whether they think that venue would pass it and suffice. So what do you feel is is inhibiting from those five objectives or the way this local uh, jurisdiction is working? I think if, if a local authority wants to add another objective in there, they should be able to do that. I think we need to be given more powers locally. What kind of objectives would you see is missing that, that that you feel would help make the industry either more profitable or more safe? <clears throat> wow, that's that's a big question. I think one thing that is, is probably raw because I'm from Manchester is there was um, an attack on the city region, um, 22nd of May 2017, at an Ariana Grande gig uh, at Manchester Arena. 22 people lost their lives, a lot more yeah. injured. And there's an incredibly inspiring person who's come out of this. She lost her son, Martin Hett. Her name is Fegan Murray. So Fegan has lobbied the government consistently, consistently. And she's they've, they've come closer to where they want to be, but not fully. I think every single venue in the UK should take on board Martin's law, which is more stringent bag searches so you shouldn't be allowed to take a rucksack into mm -hmm. a nightclub, definitely. You know, every single handbag should be searched. At my venues, we don't allow bags bigger than a piece of A4. Um, for, for me, that is one thing I'd like to see implemented as another licensing objective. Moving on, because we're running a little bit out of time, and we could talk forever, I'm sure. But um, we... we what I've, I'm witnessing, and you see it in the headlines all the time, and Michael Kill is always putting out press releases about the number of nightclubs that, that are failing, that are not staying open. And some of it is attributed to the, the utility costs and the taxation um, and other types of systems that uh, the industry is looking to have changed. But, but for me, I see a new demographic of young adults who are different than my generation when I grew up. And, you know, we would go out four or five times a night, you know, that was our lifestyle. And, and it was, you know, going to the new clubs and, and, and just hanging out and, and, and going out to eat after. So, so there was a whole lifestyle built around that. But it seems with this new technology and this whole kind of mega festivals, kind of like the world that you're in, that 
people are saving up their money, you know, because if you want to pay the ticket for a big concert, you can't be going out every night, especially if you're part of that generation who's having difficulty getting gainful employment. Do you think demographics uh, are a part of that? And do you think that daytime festival, what, what I call the daytime social economy, is really draining away the resources that would normally sustain some of these nightclubs from staying open? So I think there's a few questions in that. So some nightclubs are also deciding to operate from 4 p.m. in the afternoon until midnight. We're seeing a shift to that. Um, you're absolutely right in quoting Mike Kill on things like uh, utility bills and, and VAT taxation. Um, I think the other huge thing that's definitely affecting the UK is the cost of living crisis. Many of the midweek events or nightclub events are aimed at students and they just simply don't have the money to go out at the moment, Jim. So what they're doing is they're going to the local supermarket, buying a bottle of vodka and ending up at a house party instead where you've not got to pay for drinks, you've not got to pay for door entry. We're seeing a shift towards that. And that is what is causing the major problem with nightclubs whilst we're seeing closures. And just on that, the trajectory is saying if it carries on the way it is, we will not have one nightclub left in 2030, which is mm -hmm. horrific if you think about that. So people are going out less. However, people are still going out. But you're absolutely right. They're waiting for those big moments. So Glastonbury Festival, when they announced that they were going to charge north of £300, the whole industry were like, hey, we're at £300, but which is probably like the equivalent of $360. So, you know, people are like, wow, for for a festival that's unheard of. It's sold out quicker than ever. Mm -hmm. So people are going out less, but they're waiting for that big experience. Harry Styles, when he went on sale, you know, Taylor Swift, when she's touring, those tickets are flying out and no one's batting an eyelid at the ticket price. Yeah, but if you ask for a cover charge to get into a DJ club, it's like, you know, why should I pay? Uh, other thing I want to talk to you about, and I talk with Peter uh, Peter about this too, and that's staffing, that, that getting staff and this whole kind of concept of a 24-7 economy with venues open, you know, like you're saying, uh, till 6 a.m., <laughs> Uh, we're seeing just the inability of venues to get staff um, and particularly that early morning staff um, and the challenge with security and, and, and service staff. Is, is that something that you're seeing too? Could, and could that be an underlying factor about clubs that are just basically saying, I, I can't open because I can't get the staff? It's, it's twofold. I think one of them will share um between the countries i think it'd probably be very similar and that was during lockdown lots of security bar staff got other jobs whether it's delivering boxes for amazon or whether it's taxi driving or or, or stacking shelves in a supermarket and all of a sudden they're working nine to five earning the same money but they've actually got their lives back they spend time with their wives and the family and everything so that was a very difficult moment especially for security to get people back the other one that we're really suffering from, which you're not suffering from, is 51% of the UK decided Brexit would be a good idea. Mm. I think if you ask those 51% again, who thought it was a good idea, probably 5% would say yes. It was a terrible idea. During lockdown, a lot of people, when they saw lockdown was coming, especially in hotels, actually, hotel staff, they decided to go home and spend lockdown in Europe with their, their families. The rules changed during that period because of Brexit. So you had to earn a lot more to come back into the UK. They couldn't get back in. Mm. So we had those two things. People were reluctant to come back in to work late hours. And actually, some people just couldn't back, get back in because of Brexit. I mean, we could spend another whole session on Brexit. It's decimated our sector, especially in terms of small bands being able to go and tour Europe now in grassroots venues. They can't do it because you've got to get a different visa for every single country. It's ridiculous. To conclude, you know, I'm 73 years old. <clears throat> so uh, I have 40 years or more since I was in the night love life business. You, you kind of commented about your 30 years from when you started. Uh, give me like a very short synopsis when you're 73 years old talking to uh, someone like yourself about what's happening and how people socialize. What do you envision? For me, I would say going out, in an, especially in nightclub, I don't know if it's the same where you are in California, but if you apply for a license, 
it automatically feels almost like you're on the naughty step. Like nightclubs are a little bit like, whoa, antisocial behavior and all these negative things that come with it. It's very hard to find people that go, yes, we need more nightclubs. You don't really get that here. Um, but I would say at the age of 73, I'd say to anybody listening, the nightclub is absolutely key to saving the high streets. And we spoke about it earlier. You know, the nightclub is the last place you go to on a night out. And so you probably use a taxi, then go to a bar, then maybe go to a restaurant. You're there with your friends, you go into the club. When you go out and you let your hair down, you don't necessarily have to drink, by the way. You let your hair down you're with your friends. This social activity is why we work so hard. And if you take away the enjoyment of going out, then what, you know, what is the point? Why are we all working so hard for it? You know, we work hard so we can enjoy our lives. Yeah. And the nightclub is one of the best places you can have the best time. All right. Well, there you go. That's a quotable quote. Well, good luck with your book. I'm anxious to see it. Um, if I, I don't know how I would get a copy, but um, I'm certainly uh, uh, looking forward to reading it. And, and I wish you a lot of luck. This has been fascinating. You certainly are a legend in your own time um, in the whole world of, of uh, what we call the social economy. And uh, I wish you a lot of luck and thanks for your time. Thanks, Jim.